This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It is a great, great pleasure and honor to welcome you and our speaker this evening, Kati Morton. Uh, tonight, as Leonard pointed out to you, marks the beginning of our 17th year. And it's been very, very exciting. For those of you, there are many of us who have been here from the very beginning. And we've had some extraordinary people, as Leonard alluded to. and. Um, uh, tonight, we could not have had a better person to start our 17th year than Kati Martin. Um, I'm not going to repeat in introducing her to you all the material that is in the program brochure that you have, um, but of course she has had a distinguished career as an author, a journalist, and a human rights activist. Let me, instead of repeating all of that, add a word of two uh, to your notes. First, I think she's a superb writer who has the astonishing ability to write on many different subjects. I can tell you from being a regular reader of her work that she can tell a story and make you feel as if you are there with her and her subjects. I commend to you, for example, her book, A Death in Jerusalem, that tells of the assassination of Count Faux Bernadotte in September of 1948. Of course, Count Faux Bernadotte was the first United Nations mediator in the Middle East um, um, and the conflict between Israel and its Arab neighbors. She creates an absolutely fascinating narrative which provides great depth and insight into some of the central actors in this drama. Not only the Swedish ambassador himself, but for me, one of the most interesting American diplomats that we've had in the late 1940s and 50s, I'm referring to Ralph Bunch, who of course uh, was one of uh, the advisors of Count Folk Bernadotte, and of course the extreme rightist who carried out the attack. Second, and this is not in your program sheet, but I think needs to be mentioned, is that Kati was born in Hungary, and she is the daughter of journalists, very, very highly regarded journalists in Hungary. Her parents survived the Holocaust, but they never spoke to her about what they had experienced. Um, her parents were imprisoned by the Soviets on false charges of spying for the US for two years, and she and her sister were placed in the care of strangers. She was raised a Roman Catholic and le only learned much later that her grandparents were Jews who had been murdered in Auschwitz. Her parents won awards for reporting on the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, and following the suppression of the revolution, fled to the United States where they came to live in Chevy Chase, Maryland. She wrote about this in her book, Enemies of the People, My Family's Journey to America, which was published in 2009. And perhaps, just perhaps, this lies behind some of the story that she will tell us tonight from her extraordinary book, The Great Escape. Please now welcome Kati Morton to Santa Barbara. Thank you so much for that fulsome introduction. I enjoyed every minute of it. Could have gone on a bit longer, too. 
Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining this wonderful symposium this evening, which honors me so much as some of the people I most admire in the, in the world of letters and, and, and the arts have, uh, have preceded me to this podium. So I'm slightly intimidated uh, by the invitation, but uh, mostly just tremendously honored. So it's my first time in Santa Barbara, and uh, I am deeply impressed by, uh, by the community, and I hope that I get to meet more of you. It's, um, it's, it's just so heartening to know that, uh, that there's so much great civic mindedness and, um, and love of, um, of learning and of books in your community. It's, um, it's extremely affirming for, for a writer. You're never, I'm never quite sure um, if my books really get read, but it's, it's wonderful, for example, to hear Richard talk about my book, A Death in Jerusalem, which um, I wrote a long time ago, and um, and I think I would do a better job today, Richard. But but it's nice of you to um, to like my writing anyway. I've had a I've had a pretty adventuresome life, as as Richard alluded, and um, and in many ways a fortunate one. Um, and the the greatest good fortune of my life has been that um, that I was able to. Um, to start life here as a, as a little kid. Um, though I spoke no English, um, my family and I were welcomed to this country. And, um, and the, the story that I'm about to tell you is, is absolutely familiar to me. The, the, the lives of the, of the men that I uh, portray in The Great Escape nine extraordinary men from um, my hometown of Budapest, who it is no exaggeration to say changed our world, changed America. And as always, America is the beneficiary of the, of the repression of, of people elsewhere. We are the ones who, who receive the bounty of, uh, of their intelligence and their brains and their creativity. And I think that this is an absolutely relevant topic for, for our times as, um, as intolerance seems to be sweeping not only our country, but unfortunately the world. So, so the journey of these nine men uh, begins uh, in Budapest, and where where they, like my family, were uprooted by the whirlwind of history. And in my case, it was communism that uprooted me from my childhood. In their case, it was fascism. The story of these of these men was really in 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 my bloodstream, and I'm and I, I'm. Sorry that they're all men. I would have liked to have had a woman or two in the mix, but uh, but these these men were extraordinary. What was familiar to me about them, and I'm about to name them, was their 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 love of life, their their love of dressing well, eating well, but also their essential sense of loneliness, their sense of being alone in the world, which is unfortunately um, the the curse of of exile, they had started life on a calm and prosperous voyage, and then things changed very quickly. Um, they they after after they were uprooted uh, for the crime of being Jews from their native Budapest, they never again felt really at home anywhere else. But what they brought to this country was, was extraordinary. Um, the Great Escape is also very much an American story because America is a land of refugees. I, I, if I could see all of you, I would ask for, for a, a show of hands for those of you who, uh, who, like me, were not born in this country. And I imagine that there are a good number of you. And that's, that's the magic of America. So um, 
the story that I write is not only a story of triumph, because I do write from the perspective of a refugee myself and, uh, and as someone who, who knows well the, let's say, the, the dark side of, of being a refugee, of, of being forced to leave everything that's familiar, language, friends, culture, everything behind. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, there's, a, there's an undertone of, I would say, um, melancholy uh, to this tale, but it's also, I think, a, a great adventure story. So who were these nine men? Collectively, these nine men were responsible for America beating Germany to the discovery of the atom bomb, for conceiving the digital computer and game theory, and for some of our most popular romantic films, including Casablanca. Um, they also, among, among the nine, is, is, is a writer who wrote one of the truly transformative books of the 20th century, the first book to tear the mask off Stalinism. I'm referring to Darkness at Noon, written by Arthur Kessler, one of, this, one of the group. Um, two, of, two of the group, Robert Kappa and Andre Kertész, virtually invented the modern art form of photojournalism. And then among the scientists uh, were also the father of, uh, well, a rather more poisoned gift, the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, um, and Star Wars, which I think is also a mixed, mixed blessing. <laughs> but we could discuss that. But, but really their contributions to our country went, went way beyond these, these transformative innovations for they were always more than, than refugees, having experienced Nazism and Hitler and how quickly uh, a society can be infected with the poison of hate. They brought that awareness to this country at a time when the United States was still averting its gaze, still, as we are apt to do, still looking the other way while, while the European continent was swept up in, 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 in a, a wave of violence. So they, the scientists, the four scientists, were determined to rouse the United States to a fact that they were familiar with, which is that their German colleagues in Berlin were getting very close to developing um, a, a nuclear bomb of, um, of unprecedented power. So they persuaded their friend, Albert, I Albert Einstein, with whom they had worked in, in Berlin, to pen what is, I think, the most famous letter of the 20th century, which is a letter that alerted President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to the, to the imminent development of the atom bomb by German scientists. And that letter led directly to the, the world's largest military industrial project, the Manhattan Project, which led to the development of the atom bomb under Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is actually a um, figures in, in my book, The Great Escape, although he's, I can't claim him as a Hungarian, but um, he, um, he, he plays a, a rather dramatic role, and, and, um, and Edward Teller, who um, is the only one of the nine whom I actually got to spend time with, and I can't say that it was an entirely pleasant experience. Um, he, um, he was a very bitter man, a very dark man, and he had much to do with the destruction of uh, Robert Oppenheimer's reputation. So um, while the scientists were, were working at Los Alamos on the bomb, the, the two filmmakers in the group, Michael Curtiz, who won the Oscar for Casablanca and, and dozens of other iconic films from, um, from um, swashbucklers with Errol Flynn, whom he discovered, uh, The Charge of the Light Brigade, Robin Hood, to, um, 
to Yankee Doodle Dandy, to you probably aren't even aware that these are all uh, films by, by Michael Curtiz, but of course the most famous one was Casablanca. And the other, the, uh, the other um, director was Alexander Korda, who, um, who is best known for The Third Man, which I consider to have been, Casablanca and, and The Third Man are sort of bookends to the experience of, um, of World War II, with Casablanca standing for idealism and nobility and, and love, and, and um, the third man standing for, this is the end of the war already, there are no ideals, nothing worth dying for, no love worth dying for, and that it was the first, it was the first movie to, to use a single instrument, the zither, if you, if you recall the film, as its theme song. It's a, it's a, haunting, it's a haunting melody, and it, it really uh, em, embraces the, the tone of, the, of, this, of this dark masterpiece, which makes every list of the, the 10 great films of the 20th century. So how did nine refugees from a country speaking a language nobody could understand impose their vision on the world and change the, the United States? Well, that was the challenge of my, of my book. These individual lives of these men were well known, but, but nobody had, had created a group out of them, and that was, that was what I tried to do, to, to discover what was in the espresso in Budapest that, that created this, this fantastic explosion of talent and, and, um, and culture. And, and, and indeed, it, it, as, as I did my research and as I spent time in, in Budapest, I, I discovered what they had in common, and what they had in common was really that in, in uh, this was, they were bo all of them born around 1900, and it, at, at that period, Budapest was the fastest growing city in the world, and it had recently become the co-capital co of the mighty Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it needed human capital to become a world-class metropolis. And so for the first time in European history, Jews were able to rise as far as their drive and ambition propelled them. With, with a few notable exceptions, politics were still closed to, uh, to Jews, which should have given them a, a, a clue that, that things were not going to be permanent, that the, that the advances made during that period could be reversed, and indeed they soon would be. But by the time that darkness fell on Europe, and I date that as uh, roughly 1920, which was the year that, that Hungary passed the, uh, Europe's first anti-Semitic legislation, well ahead of Germany, I might add. Um, but by that time, these men had already absorbed each other's company, each other's um, brainwaves. It's a, Budapest is a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intensely um, interactive environment. Um, the cafes of the city played a huge role in, um, in, in the interaction among these men and in, the, in testing each other's uh, bright ideas against each other. Um, the schools, of course, played a big role uh, during this period. Uh, Hungary uh, reformed its, its education system so that m math and science were enormously important. And as a result, uh, the, these, these four scientists could compete anywhere in the world. Um, so they, so they, they had absorbed all this great uh, human capital in the city of, of, um, of, of their birth before darkness fell. And then w when, when anti-Semitism began to seize the land, one by one, these men packed up and, um, and made, slowly made their way westward. By the way, um, the nine that I follow are but a, the tip of an iceberg of talent. Um, during this period, I think I counted um, 
14 Nobel laureates produced in Hungary, um, as well as, um, as some of the greatest musicians and conductors of the 20th century, just to name a few, Dornani, Reiner, Sell, Ormandy, Scholti, Dorati, on and on collectively, they were responsible for creating the sound of the world's greatest orchestras. So by um, 1920, they had uh, begun to their, their westward migrations, and as they, as they crossed a European continent which was literally on the boil with, with all sorts of artistic and scientific uh, ferment, uh, they absorbed those the, from the, the, the journey from, from Budapest to Vienna to, to Berlin to ultimately um, Princeton or Los Alamos for the, for the scientists, Hollywood for the, for the film directors, um, they brought with them these, these spectacular gifts that, that uh, the city of their childhood had bestowed on them. They, you might ask, where, where did, where did the, the genetic material for so, for so many brilliant men, what was the origin of that? And, and the answer to that would be that, that um, they were uh, very aware of, of the fact that their parents and grandparents had not been given these opportunities, that, that just a generation before they had been stuck in, in muddy villages in the Austro-Hungarian Empire with, with very limited uh, scope for, for, for ambition. So they, they were men in a, in a hurry. And, um, and that, that the, their memory of, of the early anti-Semitism in Budapest never left them and served as this great spur because they would never again trust, they would never again believe that, um, that what happened to them in Budapest would not happen to them anywhere else. And that was both a trauma for them, but also a great spur for, for create, creativity. It's really one of the most astonishing uh, stories of, uh, of, 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 a, of a leap, of a spectacular leap from, from, uh, from one generation to the next. And it was, it was this combination of two things, their, their intelligence and creativity, plus their, their, their collective neurosis which, which really helped so much in, in rousing the United States and preparing the United States uh, for, um, for the coming of the war. So the fact that, that they were never merely refugees, that in addition to saving themselves, they, they really helped to save Western civilization. It's not it's not an exaggeration to say that. So the scientists in Berlin, um, Berlin of course was, was, was the magnet for, for um, great, great scientific discovery. Of course the crowning achievement of the, of the uh, 20s and 30s was, was, was Einstein's theory, theory of relativity. But all four Hungarians worked and studied with Einstein. And, and that's what enabled them to, once they got to the, to the States, to use that friendship with Einstein to draft the famous letter uh, that, that got the Manhattan Project going. And it was really fitting that it would be, nine, that it would be four Hungarians from, from Budapest's golden period that would be, whose names perhaps I, I should mention them, uh, Leo Szilard, Edward Teller, Eugene Wigner and John von Neumann, that they would be the ones to bring the atom bombs, um, the progress on the atom bomb by Germany to the attention of the American president. So once they persuaded Einstein to sign that letter, Roosevelt moved quickly to get the Manhattan Project going. So if Berlin attracted the best and the brightest of scientific minds, Hollywood had the same lure for filmmakers, Cor Alexander Korda and Michael Curtiz. 
They were two very different men. Um, I, I loved delving into their personalities because, because they, were, they were so different. And uh, at t Hungarians tend to be colorful, but these, these guys were colorful uh, and then some. Um, Alexander um, Korda was, was, uh, was a very refined gentleman who never took to Hollywood, who hardly, could hardly wait to get out of Hollywood, and, and ultimately started the, the British cinema. Uh, but it was um, it was it was Curtiz who um, who actually um, became the the so-called money director of Hollywood in in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. And I loved um, his mangling of the of the English language. He was as as well known for for butchering English as as he was for for his film creations. Um, one of my favorite was, was w once he sent uh, an aide to get a Coke, and the, the, the aide was uh, a little bit too slow coming back with the Coke, so, so Curtis uh, said, next time I send a dumb son of a bitch to get a Coke, I go myself. <laughs> and I, was, I, I had the best time collecting these, these Curtis-isms. When he finally won the Oscar for um, Best Director uh, for Casablanca, uh, and, and he, he uh, another priceless gem, he said, every time before I have speech ready, no dice, always a bride, never a mother. <laughs> um, but but once, you, once you realize um, and, and I would urge you to go back and look at uh, Casablanca with fresh eyes because he takes a, a really rather ordinary and rather improbable romantic plot and turns it into into art through the use of light and shadows. And this this from a from a director who barely spoke the language, who spoke, who had a, a long string of verbs that he would he would throw at. at at the actors, he called them actor bums because he had no respect for them because of course they liked to take breaks and he never took a break. And, but his use of, uh, of uh, light and shadow to keep the suspense going and the, and the first time that a feature film used um, newsreel footage to show European refugees on the march and the Wehrmacht on the march in, in, the, in the early scenes. It was, um, it was uh, a, a masterpiece and a very serious film in that it helped to rouse the United States for, against fascism. One of the, one of, uh, I, I, I suppose my favorite character um, of, among the nine was Robert Kappa, who, uh, who really did um, virtually invent uh, photojournalism. He was, he was best known for, for his photographs of the Spanish Civil War, which was the first total war. And Kappa had this gift for, for wrapping the faces of his subjects in, in, in such dignity. Um, he, he, um, was also, well, they were all womanizers. Hungarian men, with all due respect to the Hungarian gentlemen here, tend to be womanizers. But Robert Kappa was the, was the Olympic champion. <laughs> and uh, women just found him irresistible, including Ingrid Bergman, who, uh, who of course, was the star of, uh, of Casablanca. And believe it or not, she felt totally madly in love with this rather uh, short, uh, mangling English, like Curtis, Kappa did the same thing to English, um, but had, a, had a, an irresistible charisma. And he never, he was, he was a gentleman. Uh, he never talked about his relationship to Bergman, but she, talked about, she writes about it in her memoirs and, and confesses that she wanted to marry him. And believe it or not, he turned her down. Can you imagine turning Ingrid Bergman down? And this was, this was Bergman at the height of her, of her beauty, having, having just uh, filmed Casablanca, where she plays the, the luminous Ilsa. 
Um, the, the, um, the third man that I alluded to is, is um, pure corda, the darkness. Um, it's, um, it, it features two of, uh, a, a couple of, of, of cinema's um, most often quoted lines, the, the, the one spoken by Orson Welles, who plays Harry Lyme, one of the greatest villains in movie history, standing at the top of that famous Ferris wheel. And this is pure corda when he says, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, and produced Michelangelo, Leonardo, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they've had brotherly love for 300 years, and they've produced the cuckoo clock. <laughs> You can see I had so much fun writing this. But there were moments when I thought that, that this, this was mission impossible, this project, because what I was trying to do was not to write nine separate biographies, but to write a single coherent narrative. And to do that, I had to find the points of intersection where their lives crossed. And I honestly nearly lost my mind looking for those points of intersection, but um, well, you be the judge if you, if you think the, the narrative uh, coheres. I think that, that what, what holds it together as a single narrative is that these, these characters really were, in, what, in whichever fields they were, they were, they were really uh, temperamentally so much alike. And and um, and products of, of that of that brief, vibrant, shining moment uh, on the Danube. And of course, the other thing that that knits them together is that they were all Jews. They were all secular Jews, however, but their their Jewishness infused their temperament. They didn't know much about the religion itself. I think they were probably more familiar with the Greek classics than uh, than with the Torah. But they they carried in their DNA um, this sense of the urgency of the now. And, that, and the need, as von Neumann said, to produce the unusual or face extermination. And that's a, that's a pretty heavy um, legacy. But um, it's undeniable that, uh, that they produced the unusual. What they never found was that sense of belonging and well-being, which, um, which was really um, whisked away from them in their, in their early childhood. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really important for all of us to, to acknowledge that, uh, that being in exile, no matter how famous you become, how, how great a fortune you accumulate, it's not a natural state. And, um, and, and I wish that, um, that the world would learn, learn that lesson and, um, and, keep, and keep its own people where, where they ought to be. But it was the insecurity of, of, these, of these men uh, from which from which the world and, and the United States truly benefited. And um, it's, uh, in a way, their, their lives were, were never happy, really, or fulfilled afterwards. But the gifts that they left us and the lives that they lived were absolutely breathtaking. Thank you very much. Kati, thank you very, very much for this wonderful presentation. And as you know, our custom here is that we now have a question and answer time. What we do ask is that you use the microphones which are on stage right and stage left. 
And the reason for that is that all of our presentations are uh, taped for University of California Television, and some of you have seen many of our programs on UCTV, and we want to get the questions as well as the answers onto the, um, the video material. So who's going to be first? Come on up to, you have to come up to one of the mics. Conti, in your opinion, how did the impact of the dismemberment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire affect these nine? Well, um, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, gave birth to, to uh, these, the institutions that, that created these men, the schools, the cafes, the, the, the theaters, plus most of all, that open environment um, that was that was the Budapest of their childhood. So the empire was the incubator of, of these nine. But then with the with the um, with the end of World War One, uh, where Austria and Hungary uh, were on the losing side and stripped of two thirds of their uh, the territory, the the poison of anti-Semitism was released. Uh, into the empire and and abruptly ended this this great period of openness and tolerance and the love of the the love of the new and the love of new ideas it just rang the curtain down and and the resentment among the rest of the population um, that it seemed that that um, the Jews of Budapest held all the good jobs. And um, suddenly, Hungary was a very small country, having been a, uh, a large and powerful one. And uh, anti-Semitism uh, was, was, as always, um, the byproduct of, of that resentment. So it, it became, once again, it became dangerous uh, to be Jewish. And, and that began their, their migration westward. And by well, the way, can, you, can, you can ask questions unrelated to the Great Escape. You know, I can, I can speak from here. I don't have to go up on that stage. So who else? Who else wants to ask a question? I don't believe it. Usually I have to cut people off. Ah, we have another question. Would you use the microphone over there, please? I love the book. You succeeded magnificently. Oh, I've recommended it over and over and over again. That's so nice of you. Thank this you. This is my question. Given the kind of golden age in Budapest at this time, in terms of so many different intellectual pursuits, did you consider more than nine? And if, if there were other candidates, mm -hmm. who were they? Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much for, for saying that the book worked. Um, I, I, I really nearly lost my marbles writing this, so, so it's good to know. Um, of course, there, I, I considered, I tell you how, why I chose these nine. Um, I was looking to, um, to connect Hung Hungarian culture to America because, quite frankly, I think that, that Americans have a very narrow view of, of Hungary and, and what Hungary has produced. So I was looking for figures who would resonate for Americans, hence the, the film directors, the photojournalists, um, and the scientists who were responsible for, you know, the most the most dramatic uh, scientific developments of, of the 20th century, not only the um, the atom bomb, but but also the digital computer, um, which um, John von Neumann, I think, arguably the the most gifted mathematician of the 20th century, um, first first envisioned. So uh, I, w I, wanted, I, I wanted this book to, I, I write for Americans, I am American, so I, I chose Hungarians who I thought would be somewhat familiar to, uh, to Americans. That was the only uh, qualification. Plus, when, you know, when you write a book, it's, it's kind of like a marriage, and you really want to be with people that you enjoy when you're when you're writing about them, and 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 these guys I really enjoyed being with for almost four years. So that selfishly was part of the ex 
part of the reason, too. They were very cool guys. Well, I, uh, There's a yeah, another coming. question? Oh, we have another question, please. Come forward. You alluded. You have to speak to the. You yeah. alluded to the conflict between Oppenheimer, who was a yes. German, and the uh, and Hungarian. Teller. Would you please elucidate some of what happened? Yeah, it's a please. really, yes, the, okay. Oppenheimer, the Oppenheimer Teller dispute is, is a really um, distressing chapter in this book because, because Teller, really motivated by envy, I think, and um, jealousy of his, of his brilliant colleague, um, really poisoned uh, the well for, for Oppenheimer. And, um, and partly, too, Teller, Teller was, uh, was a pretty paranoid character and really uh, did feel that Oppenheimer was too pro-Soviet. And Oppenheimer's wife had been uh, a communist, and her brother had been a communist. So there was a little bit of uh, little bit of uh, room for for um, for doubt about Oppenheimer's um, own loyalties, but not enough to uh, to disqualify him from uh, from working on on government projects. I think it, it it created a real rift in the American scientific community too. And um, in the end, the only friends that Teller had virtually in the American scientific community were, were his original friends from, from Budapest. Um, so the, the, they, they stuck with him when, when others uh, shunned him. He was, not a, he was not a very appealing character. But he did persuade that sunny man of the West, Ronald Reagan, that even the skies needed to be uh, to, 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 to be defended with, uh, with a strategic, with Star Wars, strategic defense initiative on, on which, thanks to uh, Teller's persuasion of Reagan, we have spent billions and hopefully we'll never get to use those weapons either. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm familiar with most of the nine that you mentioned. Um, I think I'm going to have a little bit of difficulty articulating this question, so Go hope you'll it. bear with me for a moment. Um, I was thinking about your description of the development of these extraordinary individuals whose intellectual growth wouldn't have occurred without the incubator that they lived in, this society, this culture that encouraged a life of the mind. Um, and then within a, a very short time, within a generation or two, uh, their intellectual capacity is discarded. Their, their prowess is discarded by fascism. Now, yes. I've heard that fascism was built on some very, very strange uh, ideas to begin with, but it was uh, an anti-scientific movement mm -hmm. uh, greatly. I believe that the Nazis had this cosmogony. They believed yeah. that... Now you're uh, going over my head. <laughs> well, the, they believed that, that the stars were actually pinpoints of light. Yes. Uh, in, they were voids in a dome, a rock dome that covered the Earth. So your question is... And my question is, is that something that always occurs in societies oh. where they create these great intellectual powers, these gifted people, and then reject them? And my parallel is the anti-intellectualism and anti-scientism of America. Ah, wow. Well, that's quite a uh, that that that's quite a uh, a, a broad question. Um, I, won't, I, I won't attempt to deal with, uh, obviously I, I'm not in favor of anti-intellectualism and anti-science. I very much doubt that many people in this hall are. Um, as to, um, as to um, the fanaticism of uh, the fascists, um, they, um, unfortunately, neither, neither Hitler nor Stalin were, were sufficiently crazy not to, um, not to uh, understand the nature of war and weaponry and the need to, um, to be well armed. So Hitler really wanted, Hitler really encouraged uh, scientific research um, in the defense field. So that wasn't impacted. Obviously, uh, 
it was, he, he, he deemed a, a great deal of, of art to be degenerate. Um, so obvious, so that, um, that was, that was uh, a terrible deterrent to creativity, but, but he did not, neither Hitler nor Stalin were, were sufficiently crazy uh, to, uh, to discourage scientific development of, um, of the most destructive weapons ever devised. I'm back to the footnote. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, Hitler uh, probably would have had the bomb had he not rejected the, Hitler would have had the bomb had he not rejected Jewish science, which uh, pointed That's, toward using fissile materials, solid fissile materials. He directed his scientists yeah. to develop uh, fissile materials through heavy, heavy water. Absolutely and, true. And so he yeah. missed he missed an opportunity there because he rejected Jewish science, and he, yes, he I'm, lost I'm his radar capacity mm. to defect uh, to protect against Allied bombers yeah. uh, because he executed the scientists that he sent to the North Pole to find uh, an echo from that rock dome that supposedly covered the Earth. True. Thank and, you very uh, much. Yeah. No, that's 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 absolutely true. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I thank learned a lot. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask something that's actually not related to your book, if you don't mind. Um, I not read at all. that <laughs> I read that um, you chaired the International Women's Health Coalition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you also was the chief advocate for the Office of the Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflicts at the UN, mm -hmm. and you also were a member of the Human Rights Watch, which right. are all incredible things things and a great Thank service you. to all of us. And I just wanted Thank to you. hear a few highlights from your experience, because um, it is a field that I like to go into as well in the future, and I'd love to learn from you. So uh, I, I missed the last thing that you said, so you want me to share some highlights, highlights. Of, 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 that, of, those, uh, of that work? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Thank you very much. Um, in, a, in a general way, uh, I, I, I want to say that, um, that I try to live uh, a life of engagement in where each of us born into a specific time and place. And I think that, uh, that we are more or less um, duty bound to, uh, to take part in the big issues of the day. And uh, I reached a certain point in, in my own uh, career as a reporter and writer where I decided that, that I should really think about, well, giving back. And so I started uh, working on um, uh, my my first my first engagement was was on behalf of um, of journalists over, who who were under fire in their own countries. So journalists overseas. I became the head of an organization called the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I continue to to make uh, interventions on behalf of. Uh, of journalists under fire. Um, I was just in Budapest a week ago on such a mission, and a couple of months before that, I was in Pakistan on a similar mission. Um, uh, we, we as Americans are tremendously privileged in, uh, we, we have freedoms that others uh, still only dream about. And uh, I am very aware, like the nine men that I portray, I'm very aware that I wasn't born into this uh, society, and that, um, frankly, I never get over my good fortune in the in the life that uh, that I've lived, and in the in the options that have been open to me. My the 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 only thing my parents asked of uh, of us as children was that we uh, that we pull our own weight and um, and make something of ourselves. And I, I, uh, I know that it was, my parents were, this is, this is a little bit of a digression from your, from your question, but, but it, speaks to the, it's, it speaks to the whole notion that I don't think it's enough just to be career-minded. I think, um, so the various th uh, NGOs that, that, that I've worked on behalf of all in some way uh, form my, the things that I'm passionate about. Um, 
as a woman, um, and as uh, I was, I was, I was married to uh, the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook, and with him uh, traveled to um, many, many countries, um, including 12 African countries when when uh, Richard was UN ambassador, and there uh, we came face to face with the scourge of AIDS. Um, and uh, so that's when I became involved with, with uh, women's health issues. And, you know, life leads you to uh, unexpected uh, places, and I've tried to, uh, to, to uh, take advantage of, of, uh, of those opportunities. Human Rights Watch was obviously an outgrowth, too, of, of uh, uh, my, my sense that, uh, that there are a lot of human rights violators in the world. And again, living with Richard Holbrook, uh, who negotiated the end to the war in, the, in, in Bosnia, I came face to face with, uh, with the nightmare of, uh, of uh, how quickly societies can turn against their own citizens. In, 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 in Bosnia, we saw um, you know, Christians turn on, on uh, Muslims in the worst, worst case of religious extremism since the Second World War in the massacre of uh, Muslims by Christians in the town of Srebrenica. So I spent a lot of time in Bosnia during that war um, alongside my husband, but also uh, negotiating uh, for, uh, for journalists under, under Milosevic. So, as I said uh, earlier, I've, 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 I've had, a, I've had a, what I consider a very, very uh, privileged uh, and fortunate life. And, um, but I try, not to, I try not to assume that privilege. I try to, I try to keep uh, uh, deserving it. That sounds a bit Pollyannish, but I, I, I really am very aware of, uh, of where I started out in the world and that, and that my grandparents perished in Auschwitz. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, I would also like to thank you for being here tonight. It is a really interesting topic. Uh, my question is back to the Hungarians. Did they ever make it back to Hungary, or were they ever sort of Some recognized? of them did. Were they recognized by the Hungarian society, or was sort of like all of communism and the Iron Curtain very blocking out of their achievements? Some of them were recognized, some of them were not, and I don't think that, that they, as a, as, a, as a group, I don't think they have been sufficiently recognized. Um, and, and that's partly because um, they were Jewish Hungarians and partly because they made their big, big careers in, uh, in the United States or in the West. And, and um, small countries tend to resent people who, who uh, uh, make, uh, make uh, a big mark uh, outside their own countries. I, my, I was very shocked when I was working on this book. I, I walked into the high school from which four of these nine men graduated, and, and there was in the lobby of the high school a wall called Our Famous Alums. And, no, and, and this high school had produced uh, Robert Kappa, Andy Grove, who I write about in the last section of the book. You all know who Andy Grove is, the founder of Intel. Graduated from this high school. His picture wasn't on, up on the wall, our famous alums. And nor, uh, nor was Robert Kappa's. And so I marched into the uh, principal's office <laughs> and introduced myself very politely. And I said, what's with that, man? <laughs> no pictures of the, your most famous alums? You have all these cheesy rock stars up there <laughs> who probably had one song that, that hit. And, 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 the, and the principal said, well, yes, we're, we're well aware that you know, Andy Grove went here. But frankly, we couldn't find a picture of him. <laughs> and and I, noticed, I noticed that his, uh, his uh, computer was on behind him, and, and he was using Word. And I said, you know what? Andy Grove actually developed uh, that program. And I bet you could find a picture of him. And uh, so, th I mean, I was being a little bit mischievous, but, but I consider that part of my role. 
And uh, so I, um, I will go back to that high school, this was about a year ago, and, and see if they've got Andy Grove's uh, picture up there. And that, that's just illustrative of, of the fact that Hungarians are ambivalent. They, there is an ambivalence, and here's the root of that ambivalence. Hungary has not done the hard work of coming to terms with its own terrible history. Germany has done a very good job in this regard. Hungary, no. Austria, no. The French are, are beginning to now. Uh, uh, a French, a French author, Patrick Modiano, has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and, and he writes primarily about the Holocaust's impact on France. Hungary has been very, very um, derelict in this regard, and as a result, they, um, you know, if you don't assimilate, whether as a human, uh, whether as a person or as a, as a, as a society, if you don't if you don't assimilate the lessons of the, of the past, you cannot move forward. And um, uh, Hungary hasn't done that, so it's still a very awkward subject. And I'm very happy that, that they've translated most of my books because it gives people a, 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 a window into, into this uh, this very dark past, which, which uh, God forbid that it should be repeated, but it will be repeated unless the next generation knows what happened there. So that's, that's my two cents on that subject. <laughs> we, have, we have time for just one more question, which we'll take on the other side of the room. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, um, thanks again for coming and for the presentation. Uh, you touched onto my question, actually. I was going to ask you, um, you brought up intolerance in today's world, and after reading about your involvement in human rights and um, the conflicts of today, I wanted to hear your opinion on what precautions do we have in our modern day, uh, in modern day to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. Because I know that back before World War II, we did have the League of Nations, which is more or less the equivalent of the UN. I was wondering if there's precautions to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. Well, a couple of things. Thank you very much for uh, such, a, such an important question. A um, couple of things. One, the United States has to stay engaged. The United States was very late getting engaged in uh, World War II. It was only after we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And uh, by then, the, hol the, the, the Holocaust was unfortunately uh, well on its way, um, and the United States um, had a less than stellar record for, for, I would say the opposite actually, for, for uh, coming to the rescue of the, uh, of the Jews. So the United States has to, has, we are not Luxembourg. We are the United States of America, and we have, uh, we have interests worldwide, and, uh, and we also stand for something other than our, our military might. And um, therefore, we've, we've got to be, we, we still have to lead, and not, you know, the, the, the option is not uh, disengagement or boots on the ground. I, I, it drives me crazy when that's so often, uh, conveyed as those are our options, send, send our troops or nothing. We have many other options, and, and one of them is, uh, is, is high energy, creative, all-in diplomacy. And I'd like to see, uh, frankly, more of that exercised. And, um, you know, uh, my husband, who was, who was a great diplomat, used to always say, these situations, right now I'm thinking about Syria, don't get better if they're left untended. They get worse. And it's better to engage early when you have options than late when you don't, which is where we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>